as we begin to praise him. said amen he is the king of kings and the lord of lords and we worship him we worship jesus christ the ruler of all let's continue to lift him up crown him king of kings and lord of lords
continue to worship his majesty. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, God is Lord. Now tell him, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my Lord. Amen. Let's worship his majesty this morning.
Thank you, men. Good job. God bless you. Glad you're here. All right, tomorrow, school starts. Going to get amen. All right. All right. If you are a um, teacher, administrator, drive a bus, work in the kitchen, help anyway in the school system, would you stand up, please? We want to recognize you this morning if you're engaged in the work in the school system. Thank you so much. Just stay on your feet, if you would, just for a moment, please. Uh, if, um, if you have a child or a grandchild going to kindergarten, first time, would you stand up? Anybody, any first-timers? Got somebody going? Oh, we need to pray for you. Yes, we do. All right. How many of you got somebody? Stay up. Everybody stand up. Um, if you've got somebody going into uh, middle school, all right, they're going into middle school. Anybody got anybody going to middle school? All right, middle school's tough, boy, let me tell you. All right, play for teachers of middle school kids. All right, all right. How many of you got somebody going to high school? First time, going to be freshman. Somebody? All right. God bless you all. And I want you to stand. Keep, keep standing. Yep. We want to pray for you. Uh, all of you, teachers and everybody. I tell you why, this is uh, uh, starts tomorrow. Um, and it's just a, it's a, a, a privilege to pray for teachers. And I love teachers. I am married to one, you know. Actually, she's an administrator now. My daughter's a teacher. My daughter-in-law's a teacher. And uh, I know what educators go through. I know you have long hours. I know oftentimes you work in a thankless job. When I was growing up, and that's a long time ago, uh, my parents always took the word of the teacher, and I suffer the consequences. Doesn't happen that way today. Not at all. Matter of fact, if, the, if I got a whipping at school, I got one when I got home. Uh, but it's not that way. So we want to pray for our educators, pray for our teachers, for our kids, our students, our parents, and ask the Lord to bless them. So let's do that. Lord, we, we prayed already for our kids as they start the school tomorrow. But Lord, for these who stand, our educators and teachers and staff and faculty and those that drive buses and work in the kitchen, Lord, for our parents, or the kids start to school tomorrow at a different place. It may be kindergarten or middle school, or elementary school, or high school. We, we pray for each one that you'd bless them. We pray tomorrow would be a good day. I, I know there'll be tears tomorrow. Um, I, I pray that you just um, bless and, and guide and direct and all of that. Keep, keep our schools safe. Keep, keep the kids uh, in a good place. I pray you'd put protection around them, Lord, your angels around them. Uh, at school. I, I pray that uh, you just guide and direct them. Help them to learn and have a desire to learn. Be with those that are teaching and giving instruction. And I pray, Lord, that it be a great year in the school systems uh, across uh, our, our county. And we pray that you'd bless and, and be glorified in it. Thank you for the privilege we have to get into schools and be in the schools and prayer walk and have good news clubs in schools. And we thank you for that privilege and that joy. And Lord, we just pray for a great school year as it begins tomorrow. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you so much. We love teachers and appreciate you for what you do. Now, Adam's already mentioned this. I want to mention again. Um, you need to go to the schools and pray today. Go to the school of your choice. Go where your kids go, your grandkids go. If you don't have kids or grandkids, just go to a school. If you need some help in the direction of your prayers as you leave today on a table, right outside the, this door here, right on the left, there's some prayer guides that kind of guide you in praying and how to pray for our schools. And let me tell you, we've been doing this for a number of years, going to the schools and pray. And every year I send a letter to the administrators and the principals. And I tell you, all the responses, every year all the responses, but especially this year, I could not believe the overwhelming number of responses I received from principals. And not just, yes, you can come, but long explanations of we need you to pray for us. And this is what you can pray for. As a matter of fact, um, there were schools that said our doors are going to be open from 2 to 4 today. Uh, your people are welcome to come into schools and prayer walk, pray, pray walk, prayer walk the halls of our school. Uh, they recognize the need of prayer. They recognize the need of that. And the doors are open for us. And as Adam mentioned, uh, we don't know how long those doors will remain open. But we want to take advantage of that. And so and we encourage you to go pray at the schools today. Uh, if you would, any time during the day, but don't go as late as midnight, okay? You might get arrested. Uh, go before it gets dark, you know, and pray and prayer walk 
and pray for folks as they begin tomorrow. Now let me pray for everybody else, or mention to everybody else, and I pray for you and I pray for me privately. Tomorrow traffic will be back up, okay? So just be patient. It's traffic again. And so uh, we're going to get back in swing. And then next Sunday morning, uh, we'll be, next Wednesday, as Adam mentioned, we'll be back in full swing with our Wednesday night schedule. Next Sunday, we're back with our regular Sunday schedule with 5 o'clock worship. By the way, next Sunday at 5 o'clock, Pastor Chuck is going to begin a study of the book of Revelation. And you want to be here for that. It's going to be great. Next Sunday morning, we'll begin a series of messages on the names of God. I hope you'll come and be a part of that. And uh, I encourage you to be a part of the choir. Join the choir. It used to be when the choir stayed in the choir loft, I could say this. Now they come down. But I used to say, get behind the pastor, join the choir. Well, you come down. Get behind the pastor and come down, join the choir, all right? You're welcome. And uh, they rehearse on Wednesdays. And so if you have any questions about the choir, uh, music ministry, please ask Brian. We, we appreciate them so very, very much. Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, and we're going to close out the series on the prodigal uh, sons and the prodigal, and um, I, want, I want to remind you before we read the text that, that Jesus is telling the parable within the earshot of the scribes and the Pharisees who are very condemning and very critical of his association with sinners. Uh, they condemned him and criticized him because he he hangs around sinners and he fellowships with sinners and he enjoys meals with sinners and they were very critical of that. And so he tells the parable. Well, we've already talked about the nature of the father. He's a good father. And last week we talked about the younger son and uh, him coming to himself and returning to the father and the father received him. Uh, today we want to talk about the elder brother. There are a lot of thoughts that went through my mind in looking at the text as it deals with the elder brother. Um, Think about this. The elder brother, so close to the father, yet so far away. That's true. Think about the elder brother. The root, root cause of all that he was going through was the sin of pride. He was very proud. He was very arrogant. He thought more highly of himself than he ought to think. Uh, can you get the connection Jesus is making with the Pharisees and the scribes? You, you think you're super spiritual and you think you're super righteous. And he's telling, look at this elder son. Listen to what I'm saying. And, and so there's a word here for us, but also it's a word to the church. It's a word to us who sometimes by being in the family of God and being in the family of God and the longer we're in the family of God, if we're not careful and we begin to neglect the, the intimate walk with the Father, we can become very pharisaical in our thinking and our way of life. I'll just make a confession to you. I made the confession in the early service. There was a time in my life when I was a Pharisee in that I had the spirit of a Pharisee. If you didn't look right, smell right, walk right, talk right, cross all the T's and dot all the I's as it relates to churchianity, then you had a problem. And I was more driven by legalism than love. I praise the Lord I'm not in that disposition anymore. That was many, many years ago. The Lord has to uh, do something in our hearts. The Lord has to change our heart. And as we love Him and know Him intimately and personally, we begin to love people as he loves them and see people as he sees them and respond to people as he would respond to people. So I'm going to read the text, beginning in the 25th verse of the 15th chapter of Luke's Gospel. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And uh, he summoned one of his servants and began inquiring what these things might be. And he said to him, Your brother has come. And father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry. Now, get this. He became angry. Now, do you think if the elder brother's heart was the heart of the father, he would have become angry? I mean, this elder son lived with the father. He saw the disposition of father. He saw the anguish and the worry in the heart of the father over this wayward child that went off in a far country. 
And when he comes home, the father receives him gladly. But the elder son cannot receive him gladly, will not receive him gladly, is even hacked at the father for receiving the boy gladly. And the Bible says he was angry. He was angry. Now notice this. He became angry, verse 28, and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. Now I want you to see a spirit. The spirit of the elder brother is in verse 29. This is the spirit of the Pharisee. This is the spirit of those that are holier than thou, who are filled with self-righteousness, who think more highly of themselves than they ought, and perhaps whose motive of serving the Father is not what it ought to be. But he answered and said to his father, Look, now, and you gotta get, you got to put yourself into this and see what's happening here. The father is concerned the son has come home and the, the, the older brother won't come in and so the father went out to him to plead with him to come in and he was angry, he got angry. And his response to the father is, hey, you wait. You look here. He's angry. You just look. Notice what he says here. Look, for so many years I have been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours and yet you never have given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. That guy was a Baptist sure as I'm standing right here. You did that for them. You didn't do that for me. You did that for them. You didn't do that for me. You did that for them. You didn't do that for me. I've been serving you and being good boy and staying home and minding my manners and taking care of the business on the farm, and you've never done that for me. But when this son of yours came home, notice he didn't say, my brother. He didn't even claim kin. When your son, your son, when your son came home who has devoured your wealth, he reminds him. Here's, what, here's his flaws. Here's what he's done. He's devoured your wealth with prostitutes, and you've killed a fatted calf for him. Now, I want you to listen, look at verse 31, because this is, this is the heart of the father, and this is the response of the father. And he said to him, Son, you've always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. The guy didn't even know who he was. He he didn't know his position. He didn't know his status. The father says, Hey, son, wait just a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Don't you know who you are? Don't you know who I am? All that I have is... Is my, all that I have, everything that I have, everything is yours. See, it helps us and it's good for us to know who we are in Christ Jesus and who we belong to. And this guy was so caught up in, in legalism and in the, the spirit of the Pharisees and crossing T's and dotting I's and rules and regulations and list and, and building his own way in a self-righteous manner, he had forgotten to whom he belonged. And the father says, we had to celebrate and rejoice for this your brother was dead and has been made alive, was lost, and is now found. The Pharisees believed that they had a handle on God, they were people of God, and that they could maintain their place and have his blessing and his favor by their performance and by their religious duty and obligation. In other words, we, we can attain our happiness and, uh, and we can gain salvation by our achieving perfection and performing and obeying all the rules. And the elder brother had that spirit. If I stay home with the father and do all the things I'm supposed to do and cross all the T's and dot all the I's and I'm obedient and I'm a good boy and I'm, I'm able to notch, notch my Bible, notch my Bible, notch my Bible. I've done this, 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 I've done this. I'll build myself up in his favor. I'll have good standing. And the elder son in this parable reflects the heart of a religious establishment. That's hard, it's hurtful to say that and hard to say that, but it's true. You see, here, here's the deal. 
if the world could ever see Jesus in the church, but to the shame of the gospel and the shame of the Father and to our shame as a people of God, so often when the community, a lost community, looks at the church, they don't see Jesus. You know every church has a reputation? People have a reputation. Churches have reputations. Um, I'm amazed when I, you know, it's been a long time since I've been in South Florida and some of those places. We go on vacation, and there's Beth Satan number one, Beth Satan number two, Beth Satan number three, and Beth Satan number four. And I'm thinking, wow. Those people really loved each other, didn't they? I mean, they got so angry and fought and fight and split and split and split and split and split. And the world sees that kind of disposition and that kind of spirit within the life of the church. And they say, who needs that kind of stuff? I got enough friction in my own family. I don't need to go to church and have more. The world needs to see Jesus in the church and not a spirit of condemnation, but a spirit of love. Not that we approve of their sin or we approve of their waywardness, but we love them in spite of their sin. But when the, when the elder brother here you know, he wants to notch his gun. The older son is, is steadfastly obedient to the father, <clears throat> just as the Pharisees want to obey and cross T's. This boy is, is under control and he's disciplined. But there's something interesting about the young boy and the older boy. Now, I want you to get this. <clears throat> when you look at the prodigal, and they were both prodigals, by the way, when you look at the son, young son and you look at the older son, there's something very connected there the interesting thing about the older boy and the younger boy is this neither of them had any affection for their father neither one the young son didn't have affection for the father the older son didn't have the affection to the father when the elder brother <clears throat> discovers that dad strung a party for the wayward, despicable brother, he becomes angry. He refuses to go into the celebration, and he's mad. What do you see there? You see anger. You see hostility. You see the spirit of the Pharisee. You spirit, see the spirit of the moral conformist. You see the spirit of that one that's, that crosses T's and dots I's and is driven by performance and rules and regulation, <clears throat> not relationship. Not relationship. And we've been learned a long time learning these things. It's about a relationship. It's not about the rules and regulations and crossing T's and dotting I's. It's about a relationship with the Father. And the Pharisees are listening to Jesus tell the story. And they're probably, oh my, I can't believe you're saying this. Because it's directed right at their heart and their spirit. The elder brother is becoming angry and infuriated at the father for showing love to the son and he's a filthy sinner that's wasted his substance and riotous living and I'm a saint and I'm crossing T's and dotting I's and being a good boy. And he gets angry. And what do you see here? He can't rejoice. He can't celebrate that his brother has come home. And here's what we know. The spirit of the Pharisee is this. He cannot rejoice over the things that the father rejoices over. He can't. That's not, that's not who he is. He has his own list. He has his own way of getting to God. He has, he has his own way of reaching God. He thinks by his performance and his mora morality that he can achieve his own salvation. He can't stand somebody that breaks the law. He can't stand somebody that misses the mark. He can't stand somebody that hit, can't hit the target. And so the Pharisees are probably gasping and, and are, are just overwhelmed by what Jesus is saying, why doesn't the elder brother go into the party? Because he's trying to build his own way up and make his own way. He's full of himself. He's full of pride. And that's the thing. The thing that hardens his heart toward the father and the thing that hardens his heart toward his brother is his pride. His pride. It's his own self-righteousness that has hardened him toward his father. He is self-righteous. He's very condemning and belittling of his brother who has sinned and missed the mark. Is that our spirit? 
Do you reckon he's really saved? You know, he was a drunk and ran around and slept in the gutter. You think he's really saved? You ever heard anybody say that? I have. That may be true. I mean, I know. But, you know, the only reason he's at church is election time. You know that, don't you? You don't know his heart. We can be so condemning and judgmental. That's the spirit of the Pharisee. And both of these boys, in actuality, rebelled against their father. One went to the far country, but he came to himself, and he thought about his good father. And he returned home. The elder brother stayed under the roof with his father, but he was more distant from the father than the young son was who was in the hog pen in a far country. You know why I say he was more distant? Because when you read the parable, you understand this. The elder brother who stayed home had no affection for the father. The younger boy who went home had no affection for the father. But the younger boy in the pig pen began to think about his good father. I have a good father. The elder brother didn't see his father as being good. He can't believe he's receiving this scoundrel back into the family. He didn't see his father as being good. But the younger boy thought his father was good. The older brother was trying to, to get control of the situation. And he said to his dad, I can't believe you're letting him come back home. I, listen, I never disobeyed you. Now what's he saying? You're obligated to me. I stayed home. I follow the rules. I crossed the T's. I dot the I's. I've been here with you all these years while he's been away, partying, living in a gutter, living like a tramp. I've stayed here, done what I'm supposed to do. You're obligated to me. You're obligated to me by my own righteousness. Now, wait a minute. I don't have any righteousness. Do you? I don't. I can cross T's and dot I's and cross T's and dot I's and cross T's and dot I's, and I don't have any righteousness. None. The righteousness I have is the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. I have by faith in Jesus Christ, receive the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, except your righteousness becomes that of the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And people would shake and shudder. How is it possible that anybody can be more righteous than the Pharisees? But it was the kind of righteousness that would choke you to death. Jesus is the one that came to bring righteousness that was complete and perfect, appealing to the Father and received by the Father. And the righteousness that we need is the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't come by works or performance. It's coming by the end of yourself and coming to the end of yourself, confessing your sin, acknowledging your sin, turning to the Savior, turning to the Father, and repenting of your sin and inviting Him into your life to become your life and your own righteousness. I have no righteousness. And so this elder brother thinks he has righteousness. He thinks he has righteousness because he's performing. But he has a bitter spirit. Can I tell you, I know you'll agree with this. Some of the most miserable people on the face of the earth, bitter, bitter, indifferent, angry, hostile, filled with hostility. Some, most of those folks, a lot of those folks are in church. You know why? They got just enough of religion to bug them rather than bless them. And it's not what religion you need. It's relationship. You know the rules, you know the regulations, and you try to live out the rules, and you try to live out the regulations, and you think you're doing well, and living out the rules and the regulations, you think you've obligated the Father to take care of you and show you favor. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way at all. And so this boy got angry because he thought the Father was obligated to him because he had tried to live in a righteous fashion and obey all the rules. If you keep the rules, he thought, then God is obligated and indebted to you. Let me tell you, that's not the way it is. So when Jesus comes on the scene, he gives us the parable. Jesus goes much deeper talking about lostness and what sin is. Because nearly everyone defines sin as breaking the rules. Breaking the rules. But sin is so much more than breaking the rules. It's rebellion against God. It's looking to yourself 
to be able to reach up to God within yourself by moral, perf by moral performance and attaining a, 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 your own particular righteousness whereby you obligate God to you. And you and I cannot obligate God to us. Can I tell you something? God doesn't need Al Quinn. God doesn't need you. God doesn't need any of us to be God. God is not dependent upon anything outside of himself to be God. God is God. And it's not that I have to serve God. I get to serve God. It's not that I serve in drudgery and resentment and hostility. And I serve with the understanding that if I serve God, he owes me a favor. It doesn't work that way. And I know everyone's guilty of this. We feel like if we're serving God and we're being faithful and we're doing everything and playing by the book, when tragedy and hardship comes, we say, why me? What about those people over there that don't darken the door of the church, could care less about God? What about them? They're getting blessed. They don't have trouble. We understand something. God is no respecter of persons. He lets the rain fall on the just and the unjust. He lets the sun shine on the just and the unjust. And it's not that we've obligated God and God's obligated to us. God is God. And he does his will and his way for his purposes and his glory. God's not obligated to me. I'm blessed that I'm part of the family of God. But I want you to see this. I want to talk about the lostness here. The sign of the lostness in the elder brother is this. He was angry. He was angry. The Bible says when the father says, won't you come in? He was angry. When life doesn't go the way you think it should, you become deep, deeply angry, resentful, bitter. God owes me for my moral righteousness and for the way I've lived and obeyed. God owes me. Let me tell you what we're owed. Let me tell you what we deserve. You know what we deserve? We deserve alienation. We deserve estrangement. We deserve damnation. We deserve out of darkness. We deserve, we deserve pain and agony. But he came in his love through his own son that we might have life and have it more abundantly. That's what we're owed. Judgment. But God who is rich in mercy came and extended grace and mercy to us. Let's not be angry when life shifts. You know, I, I, when Matt was sick and uh, went through that journey for about five years, for the very first time in my life, I preached through the entire book of Job. I never preached through the book of Job. And, you know, Job had a pride problem. He did. God understood he had a pride problem. And, but in the book, Job gets a bent out of shape because of his friends harassing him and all this and that, and he wants to know why they're not doing this and why they're not going through that. If you read the 40th chapter of the book of Job, God says, who are, you all, who are you? Who do you think you are trying to tell me how to run the universe? Were you here when I hung the stars in place? Were you here when I spoke into creation, all that is created? Who are you? Where have you been? Let me tell you, God's, in, God's on his throne and uh, we can't tell God what to do or how to do. And we may not understand it all, but God is a sovereign God. But the elder brother didn't understand the nature of his father. And the Pharisees and scribes didn't understand the nature of their father, their God, or God. They became angry. He became angry. I'll tell you another sign of lostness in the Pharisee and in the elder brother. The feelings of superiority. He was quick to point out the faults and the failures of his brother. And so often you and I are quick to point out the faults and failures of others. And the, the scale that we use to measure ourselves about how spiritual we are is not Jesus. But it's usually someone that's a little bit lesser than we are, we think, because they don't cross the T's and dot the I's the way we do. A feeling of superiority. He had a critical spirit. That's another sign of lostness. He seems to see the shortcomings in others, and he's defensive about his own judgment, but he's critical of others. Have you ever worked with somebody that it seems their middle name ought to be critical? They criticize and criticize and criticize and criticize and criticize, and they're critical and critical and critical. If they ever spoke a word of affirmation and encouragement, you'd probably drop dead. Because every word that usually comes out of their mouth is a critical spirit and a critical word. 
It's fun working with those kind of people, isn't it? You ever work with those folks? You see them coming down the hall, and you find the nearest door you can go in. Nobody wants to be around those people. You know what they do? They suck the life out of you. They rob you of your joy. This elder brother was critical. Instead of rejoicing and celebrating that his younger brother had come home, he's critical. He's fault-finding. He's pointing out his faults. He's not rejoicing. And I'll tell you something else about this older brother that's a sign of his own lostness is his joylessness. The service he rendered to his father was duty-driven and not driven by love. Now, this is a word for the church. Are we serving out of obligation and duty, or are we serving out of love? Let me tell you this. When you and I serve out of a sense of duty and obligation, we will reach a point in some instance or some situation or circumstances where we will lose our joy. But when you're serving out of love for the Father, you continue to serve, and no matter what happens, there may be a sting here, somebody says a critical thing, but you serve out of love, and you're driven by love. This elder brother was more concerned about appearances than seeing his father pleased. All these years, he said, I've served you. I've not been like that guy who left I've been faithful, and it seems the service rendered was given out of fear and drudgery and resentment, a joyless kind of service. You see, here's the thing. This elder brother thought, I know how to play my dad. Did you know that as a kid? I did. I knew how to play my dad against my mom. And I knew how to play my mom against my dad. Kids do that, you know that? And this elder brother thought he was so holy and so pious and so self-righteous, he really didn't know the heart of his father. He had no real affection for him, but he thought he could manipulate. He thought he would knew. He thought anything he did was out of obligation. So the elder brother thought he knew how to play his father, and it wasn't about love. It was like, I can manipulate. I know the system. I know the rules. And so he lived within the confines of the system, thinking he knew the rules and how he could maybe get around some of the system and make his own way. I hope this story I'm going to tell you will kind of Happy to see this. This isn't the Bible, okay? So don't anybody go say, Brother Al told a story today. I don't think that's in the Bible. I'm telling you, it's not in the Bible, okay? It's not in the Bible. It's a story written by Elizabeth Elliot. She tells the story of Jesus calling disciples, and he says to these men, Hey, come follow me. And he says, Hey, come follow me. Hey, come follow me. Come follow me. And so the disciples begin to follow Jesus. And while they're following Jesus, Jesus says to his disciples, Hey, stop, guys, and pick up a stone. Find you a stone. Pick up a stone. Follow me. And so they're looking for a stone. Now, Simon Peter, he's thinking, If we got to carry a rock and follow this guy, maybe the smartest thing I can do is find a small rock. Because I don't know how long we're going to walk, and I'm not know how far we're going to walk, and how long we're going to walk. I think I'll find a small stone, the smallest stone I can find. So Simon Peter, thinking he knows the system and knows the rules and how to do, he finds the smallest rock he can find. He puts it in his pocket, and Jesus said, "Everybody got a stone? Everybody got their stone? Everybody got their stone? Yeah, we got our stone. And you got this guy holding a boulder. You know, I'm dedicated. He's got a boulder." One guy's got a little rock in his pocket. That's Simon Peter. He says, follow me. And they're walking with Jesus, and they're walking with Jesus. And about noontime, Jesus said to his disciples, why don't y'all sit down here? A lot of grass here. Just sit down in the grass right here. Sit down in the grass. Boy, it's so nice here. There's a breeze blowing. Sit down in the grass. Y'all got your stones, fellas? Everybody find a stone? Pick up a stone? Hold up your stone. One guy, you know, he's picking up the boulder, and Simon Peter reaches in his sack and pulls out this little bitty rock. All the disciples are holding up their stones, and Jesus comes, and he waves his hand over them. And guess what? All the stones become bread. He said, that's your lunch. Eat. <laughs> Simon Peter's looking at his rock, looking at Bartholomew's stone. Wow. 
Wow. They get through, you know, Simon Peter's just kind of a little upset, you know. When lunch was over, Jesus said to his disciples, Hey, guys, get up and follow me. And they walk away, and then Jesus stops, and he says, Okay, fellas, I want you to pick up a stone. Simon Peter knows. Pick up a stone. So Simon says, Aha, he finds the biggest rock he can find. All the other guys pick up their rocks, and they're following. Y'all got your stone? Yeah, follow me. And he followed Jesus, and they followed Jesus, and they followed Jesus. And, and they're walking through the afternoon and the evening, almost supper time. And Jesus leads them up close to the river. And he stops them by the river, and he says, All right, guys, throw your stones in the water. What? Throw your stones in the water. And they throw their stones in the river. And the disciples had this dumbfounded expression on their faces, and Jesus responded to them. Don't you remember what I asked you to do? Who were you carrying the stone for, me or you? You know what the Pharisees are doing? It's for him. Elder brother, it's for him. He had the spirit of a Pharisee, condemning, judgmental. You know what's interesting? The younger brother and the elder brother were both estranged from the father, a distance from the father. Even though the elder brother was under the same roof with the father, he didn't really know his father. You know, it's possible to have your names on the roll of a church your entire life and never really know the intimacy of the Father. How sad and how tragic. How sad and how tragic. See, it's not about performance and it's not about rule keeping. It's about a relationship. The elder brothers expected the goodness to pay off and when it didn't, he got angry. Quickly, I want to mention something to you. How do you know if you're one with the Father and you love the Father and you're intimate with the Father? How do, how do you know? Well, you know you're intimate with the Father, our Father, heaven, our God, when you want to hear His Word and you long to be in His Word and you spend time in His Word. In other words, I don't want to be a legalist about this thing, but if you can go from today to next week without ever looking at the Word you're not as intimate as you ought to be with the Father. And, and how do you know if you're intimate with the Father? You want to talk to the Father. You want to talk with the Father. If the only time you pray and the only prayer that comes out of your mouth is, God, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, you're not intimate with the Father. If you want to know if you're in, intimate with the Father, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. If you want to know if you're intimate with the Father, Jesus said, the world will know you're my disciples by your love, and as I have loved you, you will love others. As I've done to these, the least of these, you will also do that. You'll love others, and you want others to love your God. And you'll want others to know him intimately and personally as you know him. You see, when I, I ask you, if you, here's a one and here's a ten, and if you had to measure your level of intimacy with the Father, one being low and ten being high, where are you on the scale from one to ten? Are you just playing the church game and keeping rules and checking the box? I, I know today, and I'm not saying anybody here because I don't know your heart, but I, and it could be, but I know in churches today all across America there are people that are checking the box. I went to church today. Check the box. I went to church today. Check the box. You know, it used to be, Years ago, the way we make assessment of people if they love the Father is whether or not they were church on Sunday night and Wednesday night. I mean, is that the way you tell if somebody loves Jesus? Well, I wouldn't discourage folks from coming to church on Sunday night and Wednesday night, but I will tell you, that's not the gauge. I can't see your heart. I don't know your obligations. I don't know your responsibilities. But if we love the Father... We're going to rejoice in the things that he rejoices over. And we're going to be about the things that he's about. 
because we're intimate with the Father. So I want to ask you a question. Do you have the spirit of the elder brother? Looking down your nose, making assessments, making judgments, condemning, criticizing. That's not the heart of Jesus. That's not the heart of the Father. You know the amazing thing is? There's nowhere in that parable where it says the elder brother ever came in the house to join the party. You know what Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees? He said, you guys are so full of yourselves and so full of your own self-righteousness. When you get a convert, you make him twice the son of hell that you are. That's the spirit of the Pharisee. That's the spirit of the elder brother. May our spirit be in keeping with the spirit of Jesus, who loves, who forgives, who encourages, who embraces who extends grace, who extends mercy. That should be our spirit. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, may our spirit be in keeping with your spirit, and may we be one with you. Forgive us, Lord, when uh, we're prone to be critical, judgmental, antagonistic. Forgive us when we think they're obligated to us because we do church and we're about church, and we love you, and we're trying to follow you. We shouldn't have any pain. We shouldn't have any struggles. We shouldn't have any difficulty. Well, that's not true. So often when those things come, we get angry. When life doesn't go the way we think it should go, sometimes we get angry. Father, help us to know that in every circumstance, in any situation, you orchestrate those things for our good and your glory. But especially in the light of the parable, may we be burdened over those who are lost and away from you, the Father. May we not be critical of them, but may we love them. May we reach out to them. And when they respond to the gospel, may we rejoice with them. Celebrate their new life in Christ. May that be the spirit, our spirit, the spirit of this church. To celebrate life and to celebrate those who find life in Christ. Lord, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you, may they come and respond to the gospel and trust Christ. May we be obedient as you call us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand, as we sing.